We are recording and welcome. I'm Craig Icorn, Public Relations Specialist, our Superintendent, Mr. H.T. Chambers. I'm going to start sharing my screen while he makes his opening remarks. Mr. Chambers. You bet. Before you share your screen, keep keep the full group here. Um, I want to keep an eye on who's falling asleep while I talk and who's, uh, who's under their covers in bed. Somebody. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, I appreciate everyone joining us. I know there's uh, by the by the end of my comments, we'll probably have 85, 90 people on the on the in the meeting. Uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to start and and just for those of you that were in the meeting uh, last time, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, in particular the the uh, the parents and community members that are a part of this this group. Uh, uh, I want to just kind of reflect back on that, and I know a lot of water is going under the bridge, so most of us don't remember, don't remember a lot of it. But I want to I want to reflect back on the towards the end of the meeting. Uh, there was a, there were some conversations from uh, from a couple of parents, Mr. Franklin and uh, Miss Pete and Mr. Uh, Mr. Judson, I believe it was, and the conversation centered around facilities, and it centered around. Uh, uh, quality of facilities. It, 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 you know, there were there were some comments and and about uh, how we lose students a lot of times. In many cases, not all, but in many cases, due to just you know a, a, a facility or something that is considered to be substandard. And and I want to spend just a second, Michelle. So bear with me. Uh, I had originally told Michelle and others I was going to record a message in a video, and I I thought better of it because I did like two takes, and I I bet I had fourteen bloopers in the middle of it, so I didn't. I didn't do that, but I want to I want to reset uh, kind of what my thoughts are as it relates to Ailey ISD. Uh, why we're doing this? Why we're having a bond election? What's the reason for it? And the 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 thing that struck me from that that those comments that were made by Mr. Franklin and Ms., Mr. Judson and Ms. Pete and a few others last month. Uh, it, it, it struck me in a way in which it made me rethink uh, and reminded me of what our goal and what our job is here. Uh, what I heard being said in, in, is that every one of us, every one of us must aspire and must desire the best for our kids. That means brick and mortar, that means programs, that means quality of education. Um, I heard, I've heard over and over, over and over, that Ailey ISD offers every opportunity for every kid. We, we, you put everything that we, we provide opportunities for kids in a up against any district in this area, we win hands down. That means programs for career and technology education. That means career military, readiness, uh, military readiness, academic readiness. Um, we, we, we are never, we're never criticized for, for programs that we offer. We're never criticized for the quality of the programs we offer. Um, but what, but I, what I do know is that parents, like the three I've just mentioned, and, fan, and community members, what they do expect in addition to that, and sometimes this is what makes the difference, and I expect this, is that I want the best quality facility for every child, whether it's an athletic facility, a fine arts facility, a facility for third graders to, to perform in. I, I don't care. They deserve it. They deserve it. And, and me as a taxpayer in this district, and you, for those of you that are taxpayers in our school district, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to do our due diligence as we make determinations as to um, what we can afford, what we're willing to afford. And as a bond committee, where should we focus our efforts? Um, I told our leadership team the day after that meeting, I said, if it was up to me, I'd bulldoze every school tomorrow and rebuild a brand new one if I could, because our kids deserve it. Now that's not realistic and we can't do that. But by God, with, with what we're working on now, whether it's through athletics, fine arts, CTE, technology, uh, what we're gonna, we're gonna continue hearing about, I, I hope that every one of us and again, I'm talking to community members and, and parents in particular. I hope that as we go through this, you continue being a champion and an ambassador for your school district. We, um, 
we need to hear your voice. We, we have got to hear your voice and, and you are speaking for those of you who are community members and parents, you are speaking for thousands of others that either don't know how to speak, don't, have, don't, don't are not comfortable, don't know how to do it, don't, don't want to deal with the bureaucracy of a big school district. There's a million different reasons. But, but as, we, as we continue moving forward on this, I, want, I, I hope that our mindset, both uh, staff members of our school system, as well as the parents and community members, I hope that our mindset is that we, we are going, we want the best for our children, period. If, if, I, if, if we were in a very affluent community, I would have no problem. I'd be hearing from parents every day. I would be hearing, school board members would be hearing from them every single day. They would be in the office, they'd be calling, they'd be emailing, they'd be, excuse my language, but they would be raising hell about some, some facility that they didn't have. Our parents want the same thing. I want us to be that voice for them. I want us to continue to be that voice for them. Uh, our taxpayers have committed to quality early childhood pre-K. We have almost $90 million. We're building buildings as we speak from 2015. They wanted meaningful career opportunities for our children in a quality facility. They got it. We wanted quality professional development opportunities for our teachers and our staff. We've got that. I think we need to continue with that. And as a parent, I, uh, I am, I am uh, I'm more than in debt and gratitude for you participating in this. But I want you to know that I hear you. And when you're when you make your when the comments are about the facilities or the quality of them, I know that you're speaking not only on behalf of you and your family and your child, but you're speaking on behalf of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of other of other families and other parents in this community. And and as a committee, as a bond committee, it is our job, it is our responsibility to attempt to meet all of those needs and those expectations as a superintendent. And for any board member that's on, on the, in our meeting, it is my responsibility to the soup, to the board and to you to carry out what you, what you expect. And so um, as, we, as we go through tonight and, and there's gonna be specific discussions about specific issues, but I, I want us to hopefully reflect on the other pr the presentations that have been made. Think about them from the athletics, from fine arts, <clears throat> excuse me, technology, both digital technology and, and just the hardwiring of our of our technology programs in our district to what we're gonna talk about tonight, uh, to what we're gonna talk about in the future. But, but um, we are the voice for those who don't have a voice and we're the voice for those kids. Um, and I will, I will uh, I'll continue talking about this as we go forward. But I just thought last month's conversation, particularly towards the end, and I know we, we had a snafu with not being able to go to breakout sessions last time, but I will tell you, I was, I'm blessed that we didn't because we would not have had the chance to have the discussion that we had and I wouldn't have been able to hear uh, at least my observation of what I heard uh, uh, without that large group setting. And so I'm, I was appreciative for that. So uh, anyway, that's all I had, Michelle. Thank you guys for continuing to, to, to join us. Uh, we've grown by about 10 people since I started yapping here. So um, I'm gonna stop and, and, and turn it back over to, to I guess Michelle or Hilda, I'm not sure. I didn't look at the agenda. That's, I'm sorry about that. No, I've got it. All right. Well, but anyway, thank you I've guys for it. being here and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Appreciate it. No, thank you, Mr. Chambers. Uh, Ed, uh, Ryland, would you like to address the group? So yes, and thanks, HD, for, 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 for those comments, man. I, I, I certainly agree and support uh, those comments. So, so welcome, everybody. and Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to join us. And thank you for your commitment and for your passion towards this effort. Uh, you, as I, as I mentioned before, I mean, you are helping to invest in the future so we can ensure that we have a great future. Uh, your candid conversations and comments during the last session, as HD mentioned, I tell you, uh, I could feel that passion coming through the computers. And, and I'm gonna encourage you to continue to be as candid 
and as passionate as you were during that last session. Uh, and but the other thing that I, that I noticed was that you, you were not just focused on your child or your specific school, you were focused and worried about, worried about all of the children and all of the schools within our district. And I think that's a sign of a great committee. And that's a sign of making sure that when we talk about no child left behind, that it's not that we're just focusing on my child or my child's school, that our commitment and our passion, our concern is for every child in every school. So we need your continued support and involvement as we go through the different phases of this, of this uh, committee. Uh, we're, in, we're in one phase now, uh, but we'll be moving through to another phase and we'll need your ongoing commitment and passion and support as we continue to do this hard work. So I really thank you so much and I'm excited about hearing your involvement and your comments today. So I got back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for bringing that up as well about the uh, maintaining an idea that our bond and the work we're doing is for all of our kids. And I, I didn't mention that before because my last experience in ADLEAF was exactly as you described that people were very eager to look at the district as a whole. I have a, a, a something I tell almost every bond committee and that is, is that no one, none of us, no single person on the bond committee is going to get everything they want in this bond. But all of us are going to get something that we want. Uh, Cam, do you want to go on and talk about Zoom before I talk about the uh, couple of, uh, home, of housekeeping things? Absolutely. So some of you who may be relatively new to Zoom, we are going to be using breakout rooms tonight and we hope that they're very successful. One thing I do want to make note of is if you are logged in from your phone but not from your Zoom account, you may not automatically go to your breakout room. So just stay with the large group and then one at a time come on and tell me who you are and then we will reassign you. We will send you to the correct, we've got the list in front of us, you'll go to the correct breakout room that you're supposed to be with. If at any time you're having technical difficulties and um, not being able to maintain the pictures or losing some connectivity. Sometimes if you turn off your camera, it will work better. So back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Cam. And I want to acknowledge Cam. Uh, she is our uh, absolute go-to guru for Zoom. And she's done a very good job of navigating this for us. Uh, we've I've not done a bond committee on Zoom before, and it has some limitations, and then it has some very strong points to it as well. The limitations are that I really like seeing you face to face. I like making new friends in ALEAP, and, and I do miss that. The, there's only a couple of things. I'm not going to go over all of our house keeping slides because you're able to look at those yourself on your packet. But I do want to remind you that we added a June 10th meeting. That's a very important meeting because we're going to, uh, that's when our deliberations will begin. And you'll also notice if you're uh, a detailed person like I am, that we've moved some content around. We're the, the uh, list of content of meetings is very is fixed uh, and then until we add a, a new one like we did but the content uh, we sometimes have to make that a little bit organic we cover what we say we're going to cover but we may have to do it in a meeting that it wasn't originally listed on, but I do try to keep the, uh, the second page of your task cycle up to date. So that, you, um, so that you know what topics are going to be covered at what meetings. I will remind you that, uh, that if uh, Craig is keeping a role on our attendance and our attendance is always very high, but we're going to uh, assume uh, three absences on someone's part indicates a lack of interest. And so we'll just quit sending the information uh, to those people. Um, we will break into work groups tonight. We're gonna give it our best shot again. And I think we, uh, I think the problem was not with us, but with the Zoom upgrades that had occurred that were not, um, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I won't even say that. 
uh, but we are going to move to work groups again tonight. I do want to, uh, Craig, if you'll advance to uh, one uh, to the priority slide. I just want to reiterate the, this because it's so important in all of our presentations. I've asked, and and this is not uh, unique to me, but uh, with all every district with whom I work, and with every all the architects, because I I like for the committee to know what priority the district places on projects. These are the areas that that those priorities will cover. And typically those priority one things are the uh, programs or projects that occur with, within three years of now or the, of the bond. And those are must do. Those are the things that we know are going to, uh, that they have to be done. They're capital projects and they must be included on the bond. The priority two are those that usually extend out three to six years. And those are things that we should do because in a leaf that would um, that those needs would fall uh, as critical before another bond took place. So the not the priority twos are should do. The priority threes those are the things that we call we would like to do these because they may be things on the horizon that would extend out six to ten years, but. Uh, and we would like to do them, but we call them priority three because they extend probably uh, past the, the life of this bond cycle. Okay, thank you. I, if you remember from, it's so hard, uh, you're you're probably just like our kids. They they forget things really quickly that they've learned. And last uh, meeting we talked about technology and communications. And I told you that we would have time to discuss those in depth because I didn't have time to give you any uh, any time to process that. So for right now, I'm going to ask uh, Wally and and Pam and Gerard to just briefly go over what they said at that last meeting. Um, welcome again. Uh, my name is Wally Rakestrow. Okay, somebody's got their mic. I'm getting a huge echo. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so I'm Wally Rakestrow. I'm the Director of Technology Services. Um, I have the, the pleasure of reviewing for you tonight, as Michelle said, the items that we presented to you last month. We know we presented a lot of information to you and a lot of folks presented to you last night, so we thought it might be um, easier if, if I just simply go through these, give you a couple of words of reminder for each one, because I know they're very shortly listed here in terms of number of words, so I'll try to be brief, but I will try to give you a little bit of reminder of what that item was so that when you do go in your breakouts, um, you won't be trying to, to, to hurry and remember what those were. So I'll go ahead and get started. The first priority that you heard about last month was Gerard telling you about our telecommunications and phone system replacement. Um, that's 6,300 approximately telephones throughout the district. Um, we receive anywhere from 15 to 16,000 inbound and outbound calls. And basically those phones, not only are they a legal requirement to have in our instructional and non-instructional areas, but they're also that primary conduit from parent to teacher and for our instructional and non-instructional communications. And this is one of those priorities that um, even though those years don't exactly match up right, those are if this is a life cycle replacement that when it does occur, we don't expect it to be three years, but when it does occur, that equipment life cycles and it has to be replaced. So it's one of those weird ones. Matter of fact, all of these are that kind of get placed in that priority one but they may actually occur in year five, but it's to handle end of life cycle, end of life, non-supported equipment throughout our district. Um, that priority was a priority one was approximately $3.2 million. The next priority that we shared with you last month was our network infrastructure. That was that network equipment, the Wi-Fi, the wired connections. We talked about it being that 
um, communication superhighway. It literally is the network that allows our students, our staff, our instructional processes to occur, our non-instructional. We talked about, if you remember, all of our devices connect to that network, including our utilities, um, HVAC, and then the, those things that maintenance talks about. So it's like almost everyone who talks to us talks about the devices and things that they need to get their job done, even from athletics everything sits on that network and again this is one of those priorities that is based on we probably won't do it in three years but the reason it was listed as a priority if we remember those slides from last month was that when that equipment reaches end of life it becomes a we have to replace it sort of thing from a maintenance perspective from a compatibility perspective and I like what Mr. Chambers said earlier tonight about the competitive edge of our students and providing what's best for our students and I think we learned that providing not only communication and anytime, anywhere access, but also those network and bandwidth and things um, to give them access to those instructional resources. So that was a priority one, and that was a $13.2 million item. The next priority, or really the next four priorities, are all about student and teacher access to instruction and relevant materials in the instructional process. And we talked a lot about what those existing computer populations and device populations and usable connectivity that we have for students. And we talked about an aging population of devices. And so that first priority where update campus device inventories, those are existing devices that we have in our district. And I think we shared those large numbers of you know, Chromebooks and iPads and desktops and laptops and that wide variety of equipment but it is aged and we have a large percentage of that equipment that's already out of warranty. It doesn't provide that really consistent experience, equitable access for students. And so that first item was a priority one, again, um, would probably occur early in this cycle to replace those aged and, and out, of, out of use devices. And there, that's around $5 million. The next priority is the student devices we talked about, which is a complement to that previous priority. But if you remember, Frank talked about the banding or grade specific target of devices for that consistent instructionally driven experience for students to have access. So we, we I think they talked about last time pre-K through one might be a certain number of iPads, for instance, as an example, or maybe grades to eight might be a certain number of classroom laptops or other types of devices and so on all the way through 12th grade. And those are devices that would be in the classroom readily available. They would combine with the devices we already have and be very much grade level instructionally driven target targeted devices. And that was a $3.8 million priority. The next priority was to provide teachers mobile devices, relevant devices that match very well with not only what they need to do as teachers and we what we learned from digital learning and virtual learning and all of our Zooms and everything and how that might look like quite different, but also to give them a relevant device that matches very nicely with the instructional process and what students are using. So it's a little different device, but it gives them that mobility and that anytime, anywhere access and lets them provide rich, rich lessons and, and rich learning. The next priority was um, presented on devices for online testing that I think by year 22, 23, and even prior to that 21, 22, state of Texas is gonna require all state star or telpass online testing it has to be done online. And we already have self-assessments or district local assessments that we're beginning to do online so that we're ready by that 22, 23. And these were the devices that were established that need those populations that need to be in place to augment the other devices that we've talked about here. So it's kind of a cascading building on itself so that we can meet that mandate and provide reliable online testing for our students. And then that final priority was our strategic replacement cycle. That was, I used the word umbrella, but that was that strategic approach at how do we maintain all of these devices and, and access for students over time. And so again, it was decided that was a priority one, but simply because even though that happens over the course of several years, 
equipment ages at a, at a revolving pace. You know, all of the equipment's not the same age. It's bought over the course of years. So we have to have a strategic replacement cycle that sustains those populations so that we can continue to be competitive and offer the best for our kids. Obviously, that was the larger of all the numbers. That was the 16 million. And so we broke all of these out so that you could see strategically how each one of these impacts the instructional process and the success of our kids. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Wally. Great job. We're going to uh, send you into your work groups. Some of your feedback in indicated to us that you really liked your uh, smaller group time together. So we're going to send you to your work groups and give you a good amount of time to discuss the needs that Wally has talked about, uh, both in about the digital learning, the technology needs, and the communications needs. Uh, you do have a, facili a district facilitator in your work group. They are neutral to the content. They'll encourage your dialogue, but not influence your decisions and discussions. So you'll also have a, a district scribe in there who we will rely on to send your questions that are not brought to the big group. Uh, I'll give you a five minute warning at the end of your discussion time and we ask you to come up with a one question from your group that uh, we will share with the whole group, uh, the large group, uh, depending on the time that we have. But any of the questions that are not answered publicly will be included on our frequently asked questions uh, tab on the website. So everything, one of the commitments is your facilitator. And as your facilitator, I'm the advocate, uh, advocate for the committee. So one of the things that we promised is equitable communication so that everybody knows and hears the same thing. So we will put those questions on the website so, and answer them on the website so that everybody has uh, access to the same information. So now, Kim, if you'll send us to our uh, work groups. Well, uh, I think we'll go on and move into your being able to have take a little time to ask the questions that your group decided uh, might be good for everyone to hear at once. So I'm going to randomly, I, I was able to visit three, I think three groups and what a great job those uh, facilitators are doing and what great thoughts and ideas the members of the work group have. I enjoy hearing uh, your feedback on all of those questions, but let's start with um, table six. I believe that's Nicole, is that correct? Yes, that was our group. Okay, Nicole, who's your spokesperson? Who's going to ask your question? Um, Ms. Gimby was what, um, going to represent our group today. Okay, Ms. Gimby, can, where are you? Very good, thank you. Okay, can you give us your question? Oh, uh, well, yes, basically, um, we were discussing some very interesting topics and we will like to um, address uh, one of them that has been calling us and the main top of the discussion about how important is that we, um, that we provide uh, technology and academically to our kids in a -Lift. Is it something that we consider it important to be addressed and, and to pursue that? And that was like, uh, of course, <laughs> Mainly, is, is we cannot be so part of that. We have to provide our kids uh, with all the tools and technology available and in all the levels in order for them to be competitive, not only in here in ALIF, but competitive beyond and in and, 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 and other, because we are preparing for them to, to go to the college and that's what we are aspiring. And, Ivy Leagues and, and, and anything that they can do and, and the career center, everything that so far they have been doing and uh, the district has been doing is, is, is amazing and we should embrace them. And we also who should continue, continue working and uh, along with the, 
technology provided to the teachers, to the school, the infrastructure as well. Those, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm as, answering the question. But kind no, of, great job, much, Ms. Candy. Thank you much so much. We discuss, the infrastructure as well. We need to keep the infrastructure for the schools uh, with all this technology that we want to put. If we don't have proper, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to explain it, but, but uh, plugs in, how to, how to maintain that valuable, expensive equipment because, oh, there was a cracking on the electricity. Something is not working properly and we ruin it. We're not talking about $10 here. And, and it's something that is so good for all our kids that we need to keep everything on the same level. If we are gonna be embracing one thing, we should go along with all the other ones in order to provide in better education, academic. Good job. Quality. Thank you so much, Ms. Gimby at table six. Mr. Rakestraw, if you need a co-presenter, I think you have one uh, enthusiastically in, in Ms. Gimby. Okay, may we move to table one? And uh, I think that's Daryl. And who is your spokesperson, Daryl? Yes, group one, it will be uh, Charles Hudson will be our spokesperson. Okay, thanks, Mr. Hudson. Yes, I believe our question is um, the, the communication section of of this. Is that integrated with the police's uh, the the police communications, or is that divided? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Wally. You want can you feel that question? He did you hear him? Yeah, I, I think that I would respectfully let Gerard talk a little bit about that, but they are multiple communications. They are, they are, have the ability to communicate together, but the, the police, and I think Dan's on the call, they have some yeah. specific communication requirements, which make those two systems separate, but yet they all. So, uh, thank you, Wally. I appreciate it. So our communications uh, that comes into our district also goes into our um, police station over where, uh, Chief Turner is and his crew, um, they field calls from there, whether it's internally in the district or outside the district, uh, the, the dispatch is what they call the dispatch. And it works sim uh, seamlessly with our telecommunications infrastructure. And it works very well. Um, and I'm gonna defer to Dan if there's anything else that he wants to elaborate on that, because once they get, I, I don't know how that system works uh, internally with dispatch, but uh, if a campus needs to make a call, they can call dispatch and then of course it gets routed to them and then I'll let Chief Turner go from there. Well, basically what occurs afterwards is, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. When the calls come into my dispatch center, uh, my dispatchers determine what needs to occur and then we dispatch either the campus officers that's on campus or the patrol units to uh, receive those calls. But we can't receive those calls without communications coming in from uh, Gerard and uh, equipment that Wally used. So we work hand in hand. It's just we use a state required system versus what, uh, what Wally and Gerard use. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answered your question, Mr. Hudson. That was a great question. Uh, okay, may I move to table uh, seven? That's Carla's table. And Carla, who's your spokesperson? Actually, we didn't quite get there. Do you mind if I just ask the question very quickly? Actually, Johanna just said that she'd be happy to answer the question. Oh, yay, Johanna. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Okay, so our group had a really great conversation. And our question is, is there a standard package of technology for schools um, and being formalized as far as with this bond referendum? And also um, what would fall into the replacement cycles uh, and how long would that re replacement cycle be? Pam, do you, you wanna talk about your grade kind of purpose driven? Um, Absolutely. Thing? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So uh, for this, particular bond package, we want to look across the entire district and ensure that there's equitable, equitable access to our students. So regardless of the campus uh, that a student may be going to, if they're in the same grade band, 
they would have uh, similar equipment. So for example, we thought uh, pre-K through two or pre-K through first grade would have touch screen devices. We didn't necessarily say it's going to be this particular brand, but uh, pre-K through first touch screen, two through eight, a more robust uh, device that will um, allow our students to keyboard as well. And then high school would be one-to-one. -one. And then to answer the question about sustainability, um, those, I know there were a lot of bullets there, but there was a strategic replacement cycle that was targeted at specifically maintaining and replacing over time all of the devices that you heard about. So I think the question was, what does that replace? And it would replace the student and instructionally driven devices in the district over time so that we keep them, like Pam talked about, um, at an age and a version that gives meaningful access for students to resources. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna to move to table nine. I believe that's Kathy's table and who is your spokesperson? Um, we never declared our spokesperson, but I'll ask the question and then if um, Ms. Marva Watson wants to add anything for clarity, since she asked us the question. Um, she asked us uh, in particular about um, the teacher devices that were discussed, buying mobile teacher devices, and um, what exactly that entailed. And so um, we discussed that. Um, Traditionally, we had bought a desktop device for teachers, but we realized over the past year the flexibility that would be needed in the future as we replace those desktop devices, teachers would need to have something that was more mobile that they could utilize um, at home or on site, depending on what our needs for the district were. Let's, let's let Wally add to that or Pam. So this is Pam and um, absolutely, as Kathy just described, um, we've learned a lot over the last 12 months uh, with COVID and our professional teaching population uh, needs a device that um, they're able to take back and forth from school to home. Um, so that was definitely one of the, one of the key lessons that we learned. Um, and also, um, you know, moving to teacher devices that are mobile will free up some of our desktops. So it'll, it'll be a win-win. I think specifically what that entailed was, I think we put in there a laptop, we described a docking station, and that way the teacher can come in and dock to their presentation materials and their, they can Zoom, they can do all the things in the classroom with that device and they can undock, throw it in a bag and take it and keep it secure and that sort of thing. Okay, let's move to table four. I apologize if we appear rushed. I just want to get as many tables in as we can. Uh, that's one that I was able to listen in on for a little bit. Alvia, uh, who is your spokesperson? Our spokesperson is going to be Mr. Ronald Franklin. Okay, Mr. Franklin. Okay, sorry about that, my, we wouldn't unmute. Uh, the question that we brought was, how would this new technology going forward help with the communication with parents? Good, good question. Should that uh, be Gerard? Well, um, I'll go ahead and address that. You know, um, when you say communications with parents, that's so open-ended and I can just think of, um, the flexibility of teachers having the ability to pick up a phone in their classroom and make a call to the parent without having to use their own personal, you know, phone, you know, obviously, um, because when the caller ID comes through, you want it to show it coming from your campus, not your personal cell phone. So obviously we give you a flexibility to make those calls and to communicate, you know, voice to voice to that parent. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's the key part of having that communication um, line in, that's close to you. And then, of course, you know, it's required by state uh, to have a phone in your classroom, too. I don't know if that's addressed what your question is or was there something more to it? Sure. Okay, 
no, it was something more to it as far as knowing what's going on on the campuses itself, mm -hmm. as far as the different things. Uh, like I said, I'm a sports guy again. Uh, tryouts for any kind of sports, uh, any kind of choir event, mm -hmm. any kind of, um, I mean, orchestra event, just simple things that if you go to other districts, you see when you pop on their webpage. If you go to uh, Pearland ISD, they tell you exactly what's going on at, from elementary all the way up. Even if it's a Christmas concert or something, but if you go to ours, it's nothing. I, I, I'll defer to someone else. That's not a, uh, that doesn't, you know, I think communication there I, is uh, push that question. I think that question is a little bit out of the scope of, uh, of technology and the, and the uh, telecommunications and digital learning. So Ron, I, I think uh, maybe you and Mr. Acorn need to have a, an offline conversation about that since that's not in the scope of what we're talking about right now. But that's a great question. I'm interested in that too. Let's move to table five. Jennifer, who's your spokesperson? Uh, we also had kind of worked on other things, talked about uh, some other questions. However, uh, Ani, would you like to talk about what it was that you... Um, wanted to clarify? Well, uh, the second question that was asked um, was about, and let me see if I'm gonna paraphrase, is about um, our students connecting with the best technology. And we asked for some clarity because I didn't know what you meant by connecting with the best technology. Um, and so Pam was kind enough, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the other gentleman's name to come on to clarify, but they were talking about the life cycle of um, of the assets. So when I say assets, it's like anything, laptops, cell phones, any peripheral uh, device that our students or our teachers might be using. And so it was more their, their question or what they wanted to know is, are we uh, uh, as bond members and as uh, taxpayers committed to, I guess, the price tag that we need with uh, changing out this, these devices or these assets um, to meet the needs of technology, because many times you have software, uh, and if you have old technology, you can't run new software on old technology. It just doesn't work. And we see that all the time with like our iPhones, when you know we have some app we use and they didn't update, and our old iPhones no longer support those things we used to be on. And so our students and our teachers now are also facing those same things. So it was really just wanting some clarity and to make sure that everybody understood what that question really was about was the life cycle of the asset that was it well Ani, uh, that that was that was a well-stated question did, did do you have an answer for that how do you feel we are uh are there any gaps that you can detect or or do you think we're doing okay um we need help i think we need a lot of help okay when you, okay, when you, when you, you. say, when you, I mean, a quick question, when you say help, I think when we were in the breakout, you, you mentioned how critically important it was to, and, and you questioned bravely, is this enough? Um, and when you say we need help, do, do you feel like as a committee, we're tackling the hard question of how to keep resources updated and the cost of that? Um, I, if I was, if I was coming to you as a as a change manager, uh, I would want to know what are the deals that you're getting from your vendors. And I know that you said you have great relationships with them. Um, and I know that the price point that you're looking for is to be similar to that of textbooks. Um, and just so you guys understand, like even cheap laptops for corporations, when we replace those for our for our company for our uh, employees, the cheapest is like a thousand dollars. And if what districts are used to is $100 for exchanging textbooks, but we're at the point now where we need to be talking about laptops. I thought the $16 million was way too low. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's going to meet the needs. I think that won't even barely scratch the surface of the well, needs. I, I would like to clarify for the committee because she brings up some great points that not everybody dives into our spreadsheets and all that, but I will compliment Pam and Frank. They worked very hard. 
And although we, so I guess what I was trying to express was the state really has underfunded school districts historically. And if all they're willing to give a district is a textbook type allotment, which is in those hundreds of dollars, you, you automatically see that that's never going to be enough. So in our proposals, we absolutely put in what we felt like was relevant pricing for higher ended devices. Now we typically, I mean, as several of us have kind of been on the corporate side as well, and we can't really get to that corporate device over time. But we do really feel like we pick an age appropriate device that, as you said, it's not going to be 100, 200, 300. It's probably going to be closer to 600 to eight. I mean, it, so when we look at all of those bullets for the technology devices in the cumulative, it, it was done with an eyesight towards what real costs would look like over time. More would be better, but you know we, we're, we, we're, we're doing something that really for us is monumental in terms of looking at bond funds to do something we've not been able to do. So I appreciate your feedback, but yeah, we're definitely- Maybe it's something, sorry, maybe it's something we can also consider as a supplemental bond in between because the technology continues to advance at such a fast rate. If we want to stay competitive globally with the, the market that exists globally, um, then, you know, that's something that maybe we really ought to be bringing to the parents. You can also connect that with technology to bring more awareness with your communication to your parents on what these life cycles are like for these devices and what you guys really need. Um, I, I think it's just lack of awareness. And, but I think that the community, if they understood, would be there to support their students. Um, Thank you, Ani. And y'all, I hate to interrupt. Sorry. There were three tables I didn't get to hear from, and that was table two, three, and eight. So I'll be certain to start with those tables at our uh, after our next breakout session. I apologize, but I want you to be sure that those questions are scribed and sent in to uh, so that we can um, make sure they're answered on the frequently asked questions. Um, Oh, okay. I, I just, Hilda just told me that we have a, a, a little limit on the number of words we can put in to the answers to our questions on the website. Is that what you were saying, Hilda? No? No, no, no. I was, uh, no, I had text. Uh, it was in response to um, the website question. No. Keep going, Michelle. Okay. Okay. All right. I, it, it's time for us to, you know, you know our, uh, our practice and the way we're doing this is to deliver information and needs to you. Uh, we'll continue with that. And uh, right now we're gonna hear about our, the needs in our fine arts area. We've talked about athletics, we've talked about technology, we've talked about safety and security, we've talked about digital learning and, and, uh, and telecommunications. And now we're going to hear about fine fine arts, uh, and then after that we're going to hear about uh, career and technology education. So, uh, Mr. Joseph, are you ready to talk with us? Yes, ma'am. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Renfrew Joseph, Director of Fine Arts. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge my Assistant Director Michelle Lopez is on this call as well. Uh, next slide, Craig. All right, just as a department overview, so you guys can have some kind of background information. So we cover 11 different content area programs, as you see listed here. Uh-oh, go back one for me, Craig. Thank you. Uh, 222 teachers in the department total. Uh, our student participation rate this year is 35,138 students are involved in at least one fine arts program, which is 84% of the students enrolled here in the district. Uh, we compete in local, state, and national contests every single year. Uh, showcasing the amazing talent that we have across the district. Uh, a lot of our students receive scholarships to pursue fine arts at the collegiate level. And thus, you know, we have a 10% um, of our staff members are actual A-LEAVE grads. So that's a really good thing that we have going on at this point. Next slide, please. So some of the things you'll hear that I'll kind of be touching on tonight are lifespan of our equipment um, for my band and orchestra instruments. And I'll give you some financial context in terms of repairs, capital outlay, uh, we talk about student morale and retention and the effects of those things, uh, some safety issues and concerns. And then the, the biggest thing for us is remaining competitive in our Houston market. Next slide, please. All right, so when we're talking about band and orchestra instruments, 
I'm going to point to the blue column. So this is when we're talking about high quality instruments that is considered professional grade. We don't, school districts don't really buy in low quality or average quality because the lifespan is not that long. So when you're looking at instruments, 10 to 15 years of those instruments, that's, that's usually the lifespan. So when you look at a flute, you know, clarinet, saxophone, um, go down the trumpet, trombone, 10 to 15 years is pretty, pretty typical. Um, drums usually seven to 10 years, a little less on the lifespan because of the wear and tear. And these are outdoor instruments. And then at the bottom, when you see the string instruments, violin, viola, cello, and bass, seven to 10, because these are primarily made of wood. Now to put it in context, if a child plays the flute, let's say on a 10 year scale, that means that's at least 10 different flute players playing that same exact instrument. If that child gets out of the band program, let's say in October, and another child touches the flute, that's another use of that instrument. So obviously from hand to hand, this can drastically you know, add on to these years or it can severely decrease these years based upon how well they take care of these instruments. Next slide, please. So priority one, replacing instruments. Um, we Right now we have a little over $4 million in our inventory. Um, for the last five years, we've spent $770,000 on repairs, which is about 4% a year we spend on repairs. Uh, since I've been in A-Leaf the last 18 months, we've increased that up to 30% because we have a lot of kids trying to join our programs and we have to make sure we keep up with the demand of the interest of our programs. 65% uh, of our instruments are well beyond 20 years old. The last slide we talked about 10 to 15 years is usually the life expectancy of these instruments. 60% uh, of our students actually rent school loan instruments. So 60% is extremely high for a school district using school loan instruments. Most school districts really, really be around 20 to 30%. Uh, and the pictures you see here are, are instruments that are beyond their life expectancy. They're extremely worn and, and corroded as well. Uh, next slide, please. This slide are, are some other instruments that obviously have to be replaced. If you look at the bottom left, that's a cello with a severe damage to the soundboard. Now, to be honest, you can still play this instrument, but it's not ideal uh, because it's not going to resonate properly. And that's not really what we want to have a child on stage representing a leaf ISD with that type of instrument in that type of condition. Uh, you look at those guitars as damaged. That's from this school year. Uh, freak accident. You put the guitar in a chair. Someone sits on it. Now the neck board is broke. Now, you think about it, I mean, someone was playing this, now they can no longer play it until it gets repaired. Um, if you look at the instrument to the bottom right, which is a keyboard instrument in the percussion family, um, we've tried everything we can in this school year to keep it, you know, uh, duct taped together and keep it standing upright. But again, it's just, it's beyond its age, um, age limit at this point. And think about if your child is playing that instrument and they strike a note in the, in the middle of a concert and then it collapsed like this. So again, you know, when we're talking about, you know, giving our students the opportunity, you know, we want to make sure they have things in their hands that actually, it actually works and it's something they can be proud of and they can actually take care of as well. Next slide, please. Um, so new purchase of instruments is a priority one. Uh, our last capital outlay purchase um, was in 2013. That was not bond money, that was actual local district money. We spent a little over $950,000 on band and orchestra instruments alone. So that gives you about 29,000 per program. So some context behind that. The gold instrument you see pictured here is a tuba. That's a Miraphone tuba, it costs $10,000 for one. So if I'm a high school band director and I need eight of these instruments and you only give me 29,000, there's no way I can meet the needs of the students of the interest that's sitting in front of me uh, to keep up with the program needs. The instrument next to it, the civil one is a French horn. That instrument costs $8,000 as well. Um, and most of our high school bands have anywhere from six to about 10 students playing the French horn. So that kind of gives you some context of why the need is so high for, our, for instruments and then the expense behind them. On the far left, you see a piano keyboard. A lot of our choir teachers and music teachers are teaching piano lessons to our students because we understand Taking piano lessons is very expensive for a lot of our families. You're talking about 60 bucks an hour for piano lessons. Well, they can get it actually in school. But again, our keyboards are so severely outdated. You know, you have some schools where kids are sharing one keyboard, it's two or three kids playing one instrument. So again, this is some of the things that we'll need to, to make sure we can keep up um, with the morale of our students and what they want to see. And then we talk about retention rates. It's very difficult to keep a kid into a program when the instrument is constantly being broken or it doesn't work, you know, and then the success rate totally changes. If I'm getting ready to play my solo and then my valve gets to being stuck and it doesn't move anymore at that point, chance of me getting out the program is pretty high at that point because I don't have anything that works well for me. I believe that every child deserves an opportunity to be great at something. So again, allowing new instruments to, to come into the place, um, I, I think is a great morale booster for anyone to say the least. Next slide, please. Wait, do you want to go over the total cost on that, Renfred? 
Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So at the bottom, we have an estimated cost of a little over 4.5 million. And this is inclusive of our elementary music programs, our choir programs, our band programs, our orchestra programs. So this is a K-12 music estimated cost for, for these items. Next slide, please. Uh, priority two, soundproof practice rooms. So when we're looking at innovation in our programs, most school districts that are building brand new buildings right now, they've gone to these module rooms where it's a soundproof practice room, and that's an industry standard at this point. You know, so if the band is outside practicing, or the orchestra is outside practicing, I can be inside with my assistant band director taking private lessons, and I can actually record in this room and submit my assignment to my band director, my orchestra director. I can go in there and sing a solo, um, and it's, it sounds just like a CD would sound. You know, so these are things that we want to give our students the opportunity to be have experience with before they get to the collegiate level. You know, a lot of our, our neighboring districts, they have these soundproof practice rooms and it, and it makes the world of difference. And that estimated cost is a little over $120,000 as well for our comprehensive high schools. Next slide, please. Next, we'll go to priority one for our dance program. So we're looking at pretty much the flooring and replacement of ballet bars um, across the, the district. Um, when we're talking about high school, we're looking at, at the bottom left, you see hard tile flooring, which is a not desirable um, flooring that students should be dancing on. In the middle, you see a very worn ballet bar uh, that's been here for years. And on the right side, you see an uneven floor, um, obviously, which causes some safety, some safety items at this point. When we're looking at our middle schools, we don't have standard middle school dance programs. So we wanted to make sure we can install flooring in these places to start some after school dance programs. So our high school dance programs can have a group to recruit from. All of the other high school fine arts programs have a middle school counterpart to say, hey, we're gonna work with you and get you guys ready to come up to the high school so we can be competitive. By the time our students get to high school and dance, it is too late if you think you can be really competitive with some of these children around us who've been taking dance since they was three and four years old. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what it should look like, you know. Um, so when we're talking about dancers, never should jump on hard surface such as concrete or tile. Um, when dancers jump, three times their body weight is returned. So that has a long lasting effect on someone's joints and bones. And again, our goal is to see that our students can make it to Houston Ballet or any professional dance company and then come back and provide this service here to us. But we want to protect their health and well-being as well. So when we're talking about A-Leaf Proud, this is what the studio should look like. You know, when you walk into this space, you're more likely to take your shoes up because you don't want to damage how well these floors look and look at how great the ballet bars look that's up there. So having a, a floating sub floor so you can have that little shock absorbance in there. Um, so students not worry about hurting themselves as they, you know, do all these magical things in dance. And that estimated cost is a little over 700,000. Next slide, please. So now we go to the visual arts, which is the priority one. So we're going to talk about kiln. So kiln is a, is a, I say an instrument, but it's a device that they use in the art world when they do their clay projects. They put it into this device. It heats up. It's pretty much like an oven, if you will, uh, but it heats up over a thousand degrees. And when you look at the replacement age, it's a 10 to 15 year window, very similar to band instruments. You know, it's a 10 to 15 years. 10 of our campuses have kilns that were born between 1980 and 1989 that are 32 years beyond their replacement cycle. So when you think about it, that means some of our staff members use these same kilns in our buildings right now. And we have 14 campuses between 90 and 99, uh, which is 22 years beyond replacement. You can see how, how the pattern goes. Next slide, please. So when we talk about replace outdated equipment, 75% of our kilns are beyond 15 years old. On the left, you see a throw wheel. That's 1981. We call it old dusty, but it actually works. So if any of you guys have ever seen the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, this is the device they were using when the wheel was spinning and, and dealing with the clay. And if you go to the middle, that's 1989. That's a damaged kiln. You can see the considerable damage around the top of it. It doesn't seal properly, so it doesn't hold it and retain the heat. Look at the instrument on the inside. Pieces are, are damaged. And on the right side, you see a corroded kiln um, just from, again, the wear and tear and the, the amount of years it's been here. Next slide, please. So we want to purchase new equipment. So when, when I'm going to make a personal note. So the district has been noted as a district of distinction for visual arts education based upon how well we support our program, the success that our students have been doing, uh, professional membership in, state, in our state organization for two consecutive years. That means we're in the top 4% in the state of Texas for outstanding visual arts education. So when we're talking about being innovative and giving our children, our teachers an opportunity to feel A-Leaf proud and be successful, 
this is what it looks like. So we want to replace those old outdated throw wheels. This is what a modern one looks like. Replace the outdated kilns. This is what a modern kiln looks like. You know, the art horse easels, it's pretty much a bench with an actual easel on top of it so they can actually draw whatever. And then new drawing tables. So when the clay work goes into this modern day kiln, on the right is actually what the product looks like. Now, again, this is not from Google.com. This is from Elsick High School. A student actually created this artwork. And, you know, they, again, they advance the state competition every single year. So we're winning and the programs are successful. But again, think about how much further we can go if we just have these types of innovative items in our classrooms. And that estimated cost is a little over $580,000. Next slide, please. Uh, priority three, replace and update theatrical spaces. Uh, replace damaged control light panel boards. Uh, broken and damaged bulbs, replace them with LEDs. Again, we want to save some money. We'll be very efficient here. Um, we want to replace some of our outdated fixtures. Um, so this assessment was for six intermediates, six middle school, and the three comprehensive high schools. So I'll go to the bottom right picture first. Generations old. If you look at that space, that's an intermediate campus with no theatrical lighting. It's just literally on, off, lights on, lights off. Think about what that looks like when you have a performance. If they want to do, you know, the Wizard of Oz. If you want to do Frozen, you want to do Little Mermaid, you want to do a musical in the Lion King at the end of the school year, you're not going to get that theatrical look that you would that you see when you see it in movies or professional productions. And that's what we want to give our students the opportunity to see what it feels like to be a part of a real professionalized looking production. Look over to the left side, outdated fixtures. That fixture right there doesn't even turn on. So when I stood on the stage and you step back three to four steps on that performance stage, that light doesn't even shine on you at that point, if it was to turn on, because those lights are not designed for theatrical performances. The one next to it says outdated and operable. That's 1968. That, that panel has been there since the school opened and it does not work. So again, you know, when we're talking about opportunity, we have to be able to give students the opportunity to feel successful and have a level of pride and keep them around how to keep them in our programs. Next slide, please. Now, this is what it should look like. So again, you have pictures here for some professional performances and then that theatrical lighting. We wanna make sure we have industry standard equipment for our staff to be able to get used to, our students to learn. Okay, again, we, I've told people, we wanna make sure this is compatible from intermediate, middle and high school across the board. So when I'm an intermediate student, I'm in the fifth grade, I learn how to work these lights. When I get to middle school, I have already learned some components of the intermediate board. When I get to high school, it's the same system I'm learning. So that way, the learning loss, we can cut that down. And then we have a standard UIL compatible stage across all of our, our venues. Next slide, please. Again, the bottom right is uh, from a Central Texas school district. That's their indoor performing arts um, venue. Lights work, you know, really, really state of the art in terms of how it looks. Think about what a child feels when they touch that stage, all those lights working. You can have all the colors on your costume. It just brings you into character. In the middle is in Central Texas, Round Rock ISD. That's a part of their high school. Um, that's their high school auditorium. And again, on the left side is, is from Newburgh High School. So again, these are innovative spaces where students are actually performing. So if our students don't have the equipment or we don't have the lights, we don't have the sound, we don't have these things, it makes it very difficult when we touch the stage, we have to compete against them in one act play for UIL for theater uh, performances. And this estimated cost comes in at a little over 1.2 million. Next slide, please. So in closing, again, we have award-winning programs. Our staff is doing an amazing job. You know, I feel like the district has done a great job to support our programs and, and put the funding as much as we can into these programs to, to keep the wheel going. But now it's time to go to the next level. You know, when I joined the team, one of my promises was I want to see a leaf school district, fine arts department, go to the next level. Everybody talks about Katie and Seven Lakes and they talk about Fort Bend. Well, I don't want to hear about those districts. I want to hear about a leaf. I want to see about how do we go to the next level so we can be competitive against our peers and we want to keep winning. Uh, collective input from a lot of people. You know, I've been listening to a lot of a lot of people on the ground figuring out, hey, what do we need to take this to the next level? What does it take to get your child enrolled in our programs? Again, 84% of the students have been enrolled in a fine arts program, at least one or more programs. So that's a good majority of the school district. So we want to make sure that every child that has talent, we, it's our job to ensure that they have the tools necessary to pursue and apply their talents here in ALEAF ISD. Um, next slide, please. So just a real quick summary. Uh, priority one is for music uh, instrument and equipment. That's from all of our music programs, a little over 4.5 million. 
our priority one for dance, install correct dance floor in our spaces, outdated ballet bars and equipment, remove those out, uh, a little over 700,000, priority one for art, replacing the outdated art equipment. And this is inclusive of all elementary programs, K through 12, a little over 580,000 uh, priority two, is for soundproofing of our practice rooms at the three comprehensive high schools. So we're looking at trying to have at least two modules per school because right now Kerr High School already have these soundproof practice rooms and they work great. And the kids love them, the staff loves them. So we wanna make sure we have an equitable process across the board for everybody, a little over 100,000. And then the priority three for theater is to make sure we can update, update our uh, theatrical stage lighting, which is a little over 1.2 million to, to give our kids that opportunity to be a part of some professional productions and learn it. So when they leave, they leave, they can go get a job at a professional company and they can come back here and say, hey, we'll, we'll hire you at this point. So again, that's my collective thoughts from the team, from the students, from parents I've talked to, administrators. Um, and I appreciate you all giving me the time to at least share, you know, where we can take this to the next level with. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Joseph. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go right, move quickly to our career and technology needs for the next several years. Uh, Kim Kimberly Crow, Director of CTE and Innovation. Good evening. Um, and I want to thank you for allowing me to talk with you this evening about all the needs of the Career and Technical Education Program. For a lot of you, you know that CTE is near and dear to my heart. We have great things happening across the district and all of our programs. We provide the students of ALEAP with opportunities to learn in labs and environments that mimic those they will be in when they enter, they graduate and they pursue their future careers. So this year we have 12,387 students participating in one or more CTE courses. We offer 153 different courses that fall within 26 different programs of study and these are taught by 133 teachers. You might ask, what is a program of study? Well, it's like a college major. It is a series of courses from the same content that are designed to prepare you for a career within your chosen content area. Students make these choices when they are completing their four-year plan process, and some of them may change their minds, and that's okay because we're about exploration. Within the programs of study, students are provided the opportunity to earn industry certifications, dual credit, and to participate in work-based learning. All of these are focused on the student for their future. We offer 33 different certifications and our three-year average is 2,000 certifications earned annually. Some certifications start as early as 10th grade. There are two categories of certifications that we offer right now. The first would be those that are tied to both state and federal accountability and have been identified by industry leaders as being important. The second type is those that our, our business and industry partners have identified as valuable for a student to have for their specific industry. We currently have 141 business and industry partners providing all level of support. Partners can fall into one or more of the following categories. Advisory board member, employers, internships, strategic partners, and our financial sponsors. A lot of times we have industry who comes to us and they wanna donate money and we make the best of it. We never tell them no, we're gonna go spend their money and, uh, and align to what our needs are at that time. CTE supports programs at all six middle schools and all high schools, plus at the Center for Advanced Careers, where students from all three comprehensive high schools can participate in programs that are multi-credit and require a unique lab environment that we do not duplicate at each high school. That was a result of the last bond, thank you. These labs are built and designed to industry standards and provide real world experience while in the classroom. In addition to the courses offered at all levels, we also provide opportunities for elementary and intermediate students to begin their career exploration. And some of this is done through programs that we bring them to the center, such as BizTown, which is a junior achievement program that we do for sixth graders in the district. CTE works hard to ensure that programs are equally equipped across the district and across all programs. This takes long range planning in our effort to make sure our programs continue to provide students with the opportunity to learn on the same equipment they will encounter in the world of work. As Ms. Lowe shared with you at the March 11th meeting, technology is evolving rapidly. Equipment in the CT programs are driven by technology and age out as well. Tonight, we are going to look at examples of CT equipment we know will age out during this bond period. We have worked with industry experts and prior experiences to forecast our future needs. Take into consideration 
is the current age of the equipment, models being utilized in our programs and the estimated lifespan of like equipment. For example, the Center for Advanced Careers is in the third year of servicing students, but the equipment is nearing its fourth anniversary of being installed. And some of those models installed could be even older. A good comparison, and someone mentioned it earlier, and I liked it, was the iPhone. Every year or so, a new one comes out, but your older version continues to work until it cannot support the latest operating system. This is the same with the industry level equipment that is technology based. Stay on this slide, please, Craig. The first area we're gonna look at is makerspace. Our makerspace needs are, this area is utilized by a lot of different programs, architecture, STEM, that would be science, technology, engineering, and math, and manufacturing on a regular basis. And then in collaboration with all programs, what we have identified in this group are all priority two. So across the district, we have a lot of several small versions of 3D printers, but at the center, we have this really phenomenal one larger one. It has the ability to print entire models of buildings. If, I, if we could zoom in on that picture, you would see that the white thing in there is actually a model of a building that a student designed. And it has been sent to the printer via specialized software, plus the machine has parts that will wear out with use. A fun fact about this machine is we were able to help out when the pandemic first began by printing face shields to be donated to the medical field. The replacement cost for this machine would be $53,424. The 3D scanner, which I do not have a picture of here, but I'm gonna to talk to, has the ability to take a 3D object and make an accurate scan that can be converted into a software program to allow for the redesign of that object. An example, in the recent freeze, when people were finding it hard to find certain couplings for pipes, this machine would have had the ability to scan a sample, then send the specifications to the 3D printer, and we could have printed more of those couplings for people. The replacement cost would be $40,338. The universal laser, which is the machine on the bottom right, is, has the ability to cut out to the smallest detail and intricate designs and pieces of equipment that can be used in production of other items. For example, like architecture and construction students have been collaborating on different projects right now utilizing this machine. The replacement cost of this machine is $56,274. Next slide, please. Our construction program has two pieces of equipment we have identified. Both of these fall under priority two. The CNC router, which is on the top picture, provides students the opportunity to learn the process of designing cabinetry and then laying it out so that an entire cabinet can be cut out at one piece of lumber or one sheet of lumber, cutting down on the loss of raw materials. The design and lay layout process is all done using a specialized software that then sends the design to the machine. The, ante the anticipated cost of replacement is 44520 the spindle router, which is your bottom picture, has the ability to do the same as the CNC router, but it does staircase spindles, chair legs, table legs, and even does baseball bats. All items that you would need to be identical. This particular machine has already been discontinued from the smart shop line, which means we are already facing losing access to parts and technology support. We know we can continue it on for a few more years. The anticipated cost of replacement is $20,997. Next slide. In welding, our students have the opportunity to not only learn to weld the traditional way, but they are exposed to and trained on robotic welding arms and on plasma cutters. In the top picture, you will see a student utilizing the pendant to control the robotic welding arm in the simulator. This is the same pendant that controls the robotic arms in the industrial robotics program you will hear about shortly. Students have the opportunity to gain various levels of certifications for programming and operating the robotic arms. The replacement cost for this, for, the, for this machine, for the robotic trainer, is $101,526. This includes not only the machine, but also the supporting software and technology that comes with it. I know you're going to ask, does it also come with curriculum? It does. The CNC plasma cutter, which is the large piece that would be on um, the red machine, it, it, <clears throat> is a machine that actually does the cutting for you. So the student has to learn how to design and program the machine to cut out the image that's wanted. The replacement of this machine is estimated at $25,999. All items in welding area are priority two. Slide, please. Our automotive program currently supports the district by handling the maintenance and inspection of the white fleet of vehicles, plus works on community members' cars by appointment. Priority two items within automotive include two different types of air conditioner service machines. Three years ago, right about the time that we were opening the building, 
the automotive industry introduced a new type of coolant into the AC of vehicles, which is more environmentally friendly. Our current equipment does not have the ability to test or service these new vehicles, which will cut down on the types of vehicles we will be able to provide for students relative to real world experience. The estimated cost of this new machine is $20,650. The current AC service machine for existing coolant systems traditionally have a lifespan of 10 years before parts and technology support becomes obsolete. The estimated cost of replacement is $9,900. Our only priority three item for automotive is the alignment machine. Prior to the opening of the center, we had utilized grant funds to purchase a similar machine. We had planned to move it to the center, but because of the outdated and unsupported technology, it was determined to not have it make the move. Anticipating the same aging out of technology, we anticipate we will need to replace this machine at or around the 10-year mark. This estimated cost of replacement is $29,593. Slide, please. Students enrolled in our industrial robotics program have the opportunity to train on and become certified in the pendant control of robotic arms. We currently have purchased the FANUC system as it is the most commonly used in the Gulf Coast manufacturing area. We have also been very fortunate to have received via donation Samsung versions of the same machine. These machines rely heavily upon technology as they are controlled and programmed using a pendant. Imagine that that machine that you see there can actually sort pills and put them into a bottle. As technology advances rapidly, the pendant is updated on a regular cycle and the machines no longer support once they get to a two to three generations old. This item would fall under priority three, and we estimate the replacement cost of the two existing machines that we have at $194,425. Next slide. In review, career and technical education is asking for consideration of priority two equipment in the amount of $373,628.50, and our priority three equipment in the amount of $224,000. $18.87. In an effort to continue to deliver a top-notch career and technical education program, I thank you for considering our program equipment needs as we look to the future. Thank you, Cam. <clears throat> We're going to send you straight to your work groups. You'll have a little less time uh, than you did before. So if you'll, you don't have to run through every one of these uh, springboard questions. Uh, in fact, you can talk about what you want to talk about, but we'll send you straight to your groups and then uh, I'll give you a five minute warning. Let's go. I'm, uh, I'm so impressed with the rooms that I visited and the insightful questions and comments I heard from uh, our committee members and some of our district people. I'm going to start with uh, table two because we missed uh, two, three, and eight last time. So I'll start with table two. That's Sean's group. Who's your spokesperson? Our spokesperson is Lizette, and she is ready to roll. Go, Lizette. Thank you so much. So our group had some really meaningful discussion um, and we have absolutely no questions whatsoever for the fine arts department because wow, everything that was presented was absolutely a necessity for us to be competitive in that area. And so we're totally on board with everything that fine arts had to share tonight. Uh, we do have some, a question for CTE though. So given the age um, of the CTE building and the needs that were expressed, our question is, did we plan uh, sufficiently in the last bond uh, for the needs of the equipment and the things that are there? And are we um, planning enough now? Yes. So uh, what we basically, what we look at is the, we, we did an assessment of the equipment in the building and we had input from the teachers who are teaching in those programs. We looked at, and we also talked to the, you know, um, factory reps for the equipment we have about what the average lifespan is on that equipment. So even if we had put it into the last bond, we're already at the end of that bond. So we knew back when that bond was happening that this should be a part of this bond for certain specialized equipment that had a, a definite hard stop to an end of life. Um, so yes, and we did go through and pick those big items out and we did um, consult with industry experts and various individuals to determine that the life of the bond, I mean, the life of the equipment. Thank you, Cam. Thank let's you. Let's move to table eight. I was, let's move to table eight. Uh, that's um, 
Nikki, your, your group and who's your spokesperson? So for the great debaters, we have Karen, that's going to be our spokesperson. Carrie? Karen. Karen, listen, yes. they've already, they've named their group. This is really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> We're dangerous. Uh, okay, we, had a, our, we had a pretty lengthy discussion about the, the CT building. Um, we know that uh, the automobile section does work on, on cars from the community and uh, the pet uh, area, the pet vets uh, do uh, various things, get shots, uh, grooming and, and things for people's pets. We were wondering, first of all, shouldn't that be sort of something that's more advertised, but we aren't gonna get very much if, if we can't do it on Saturday. So we were wondering if, at least for those two things, there may be others, but for automobile, that's about the only time some people can bring their car in to change the oil. And the same thing with the pets. So we were curious as to whether that's a feasible thing. Karen, you are dead, you're right. And that's one of the things <laughs> that we have taken into consideration. I'm afraid that kind of COVID happened in the middle of our second year or right. gearing up to things. And so it's something that we've thought about. I know our, our um, vet program has been, has had some vets and some other programs and working with some low cost and free and reduced shock organizations that have wanted mm -hmm. to come and hold clinics on Saturdays. And we're just hope ready, ready for the world to open back up so that we can start doing those type of things. Absolutely. Great we were question. looking for a way to, to pay for things, <laughs> and we thought that was a good idea. You know, Great question. Of, and Karen, can I add, make a comment? One of the things that in our automotive program, in our vet program, and even in our culinary program, we do not strive to make money. We do not charge what you would be charged when you go to other locations. And so a lot of times our service, especially in the automotive, is it, it, it's, it's a slight fee. Um, because if we start making too much money, we have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> well, besides that, if people come and uh, have their oil changed or whatever, or bring their pet there, that word gets out in the community. What a great job the school district is doing. I think that's good for everybody. Great, Karen. Good points. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's move to uh, table three. That's Shannon's, and who's your spokesperson, Shannon? Yes, our spokesperson is Erin. Okay. Erin? Yes. Sorry, I tried to turn my video on. It's not working. But, uh, yeah, we were very impressed by, by everything, uh, or by both programs, the fine arts <laughs> and the CTE, so we definitely saw the need for both of those. Uh, funding requests to all, all be uh, fulfilled. The only question that we really had uh, was in regards to the instruments. Um, we were just kind of wondering generally, uh, you know, how much do they usually rent them to the students and uh, how much um, do they charge for insurance and that kind of thing? And, uh, and uh, what do we do if, if a student uh, can't afford those? Great question. Right. Renfick, where are you? Good question. So uh, the insurance, the rental fee that we have for the district is $35. That's for the, it covers a child to rent the instrument for the entire school year. So on <laughs> average, if you rent from H&H &H or any other music vendor, you'll be paying about 50 to 60 bucks per month. So here it's, it's a one-time fee, $35. It covers a student for the whole entire school year. Um, and what was the last part of your question, Aaron? What if he said, what if they couldn't afford it? So one thing we won't do, we won't turn the kid away from our programs because of finances. That, that barrier, we won't even allow at this point. You know, um, you know, we work with the students and we'll just say, hey, you know, we, we'll look at covering it on our own because at the end of the day, we want kids to be involved and finances won't be a reason to turn the kid away from one of these programs. Okay, great. Great question. Great answer, too. Uh, let's move to table nine. Kathy, who's your spokesperson? Um, Marco Watson, would you like to share what we discussed? Marco, where are you? I'm uh, moved at Ms. Yan. Is 
Is there someone else in your group that can take over that, Kathy? Uh, Samson, could you speak? So uh, one of our main questions was uh, for fine arts. Um, a lot of the funds were going to middle and high schools. Um, would anything go towards the elementary schools and, and what would that cover? All right, great question. So at the elementary level, we offer music and art to all of our students. So 100% of our elementary kiddos take music and art. Uh, the music portion that we spoke about, um, it sounds like it's more secondary based, but we do have a lot of items in there of that 4.5 million that will accommodate elementary music, uh, ballet, uh, the barred instruments, seated risers, keyboards for the classrooms, um, the sound system for the elementary music teacher, the same thing for elementary art. So when you, we're looking at the kiln, the oven we talked about, that's for all of our campuses. You know, a lot of our equipment, the art level are consumable. So we take care of that anyway during the general budget. So it's not really a bond item. Uh, but for the big ticket items is, is kind of what the focus is on at this point, where the highest need is across the department. Thank you. Great, great answer. Great question and great answer. Thank you for asking that. Okay, let's move to table five. Uh, Jennifer, who's your spokesperson? We had Janet that wanted to talk again for tonight. I think Ani talked last time. So Janet's going to talk now. Okay, hi everybody. We think that both the fine arts and the CTA programs are both important. Um, and we agree with the funding request for both, but we do want to challenge the priority level of the CTE programs. We think that technology and fine arts can go hand in hand. So why not do the same thing as we're doing with the infrastructure, making that a priority one and making it a priority so that students can use that technology along with fine arts. So we're challenging that CTA moved that up. I, I like that, Janet. I will tell you this. That remember, I told you those priorities are the districts. Uh, that's what they say. The wonderful thing about this committee is that the board's given you the prerogative to change those priorities. So if you think they're priority one and you think that they should be included in the bond, you can include them even if they're not listed as a priority one. Good. That was, a, that was great feedback. Thanks, Janet. Okay, let's move to table um, four. Uh, Alvia, who's your spokesperson? Insightful Intellectuals of Group 4 will be represented by Mr. Charles Woods. Yes. And now tell me your, your group's name again. Insightful Intellectuals. Oh, okay. Mr. And Mr. Woods is going to be the spokesperson? He says no. Yes, I am. I'm, oh, you are. Okay. I'm just not insightful or intellectual. Okay, so <laughs> our our committee says this. It may be er too early, but we say on fine arts, all priorities two and three are now ones. And then also, um, we think that uh, on the CTE program, based on the state's lack of, of uh, enough credits in the day for a student that we need to look at Saturday and other programs to allow sports uh, participants to participate in CTE programs uh, fully and get their certifications as well. So whether that looks okay, like- Okay, you moved a little outside our charter, Mr. Woods. We're not, I don't think this committee was chartered with being able to make that decision, but I love the idea. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, are you, were you done? I don't want to interrupt you. That's it. Okay, that was it. So you had one that was in the scope of our work and one that was in the scope of some other committee's work. Let's move to table one. Daryl, who's your spokesperson? Uh, Ms. Shaw is our spokesperson. Okay, so, Ms. Shaw. Uh, yeah, we uh, had a question for Mr. Joseph. We were just wondering if, uh, as part of your ask uh, for budget, do you have anything allocated for repair in the budget you're asking for? Who is that directed to? That's, that's fine arts. Okay, fine arts. So, 
<clears throat> when we're looking at the, the bond items, again, that would be a general budget item. So we already have a repair budget item that we're using. It was 4% um, when I got to A-Leaf. So I've increased that budget line item up to 30%. And I anticipate after, you know, because we're in this pandemic, so we have to clean more instruments that we'll put more monies from the general budget towards repairing instruments so we can make sure we can issue them out in the fall uh, safely to students at this point. But that's not necessarily a bond item in terms of getting new equipment to come in. That's a repair of what we already have. That's what we would normally do during our normal budgeting process. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take one more table and uh, and I apologize to table seven. They're the only ones that I think I'll have left out. But table six, uh, Nicole, who's your spokesperson? So um, during our discussion um, with our group, um, we did not have any questions. Great job. Every, our, our group was very supportive of both the fine arts and the CTE and feel like students um, that are in, have interest in these areas need just as much as the athletics and the other areas in our, in our district where we focused. Uh, Ms. Kingsley, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think I'm going to, if, since you, you guys didn't have any questions, I think I'm going to quickly get in my last table, Perfect. which is table seven. And that's uh, Carla. Do you have a spokesperson? Yes, uh, Joanna Sanchez is going to respond for us again. Okay, thanks, Joanna. Okay, very similarly, we just agreed with a lot of the uh, sentiments that came before. Uh, we focused on that last question about um, the awareness in our community. And what we discussed was just making sure that the um, awareness is expanded beyond the campuses and the communities that are closest to the CTE buildings. And then of course, uh, connecting the fine arts programs and the CTE programs to the heart of our community um, so that they can understand the impact of fine arts on the lives of our students, uh, not only from the foundation of elementary school, but all the way up so they can know what's happening in the programs and how it can connect beyond the academic piece. Great work. So you guys didn't have any questions about the uh, about the presentation, the priorities, or the, the projects that were uh, given. So good job, presenters. Well, now I, I just want before uh, uh, Ms. Rodriguez tells you goodbye or Mr. Ryland says goodbye. I just want to congratulate you on being so flexible and working with us so well on a, a venue that we're, none of us are used to. Uh, we're accustomed to being able to see each other face to face and, and just enjoy the presence of, of the whole committee. So thank you for your flexibility. Thank you for understanding when we have technical glitches. Uh, now next week, very, I'm not next week, uh, very important meeting on April 29th. Uh, at that meeting, it's going to be jam-packed with information about the facilities assessment. Uh, ALEAF has older buildings, and so there's a lot of work that has to be done, and it's done so magnificently by your maintenance department and keeping your buildings uh, looking so nice and, and functioning so well. But there are things that will be presented that are uh, part of the facilities assessment that's been done by your uh, maintenance department. Uh, it's a list provided by principals. It's a list from last bond of projects that needed to be done. So we're just gonna have a lot to look at next time. And then in addition to that, we're gonna talk about new construction. Uh, what, what do we need? What new buildings do we need? Or what buildings need some comprehensive renovations that sort of repurposed them perhaps. So those, we're gonna talk about those things and it's gonna be packed full of information. So you might wanna have your, uh, if you're taking notes on paper, have it ready because it's gonna stretch your imagination. So I look forward to seeing you on the 29th. And uh, Ms. Rodriguez, do you wanna tell the committee, Ms. Rodriguez is the uh, district Head. She's the Assistant Superintendent of Support Services, and she's the district chair where Mr. Ryland is the community chair. Hilda? Oh, yes. Thanks. Um, thanks for just kind of enlightening them on the on our next meeting. It, it is it is going to be a very robust meeting. 
And um, I think it, it'll be exciting too. And I just like to say that I look forward to these meetings. I know that a lot of the work I do is behind the scenes, but I really enjoy the presentations and, and all your feedback. It's, it's, it's really uh, essential, it's useful. And your questions are so thought provoking and, um, and you can tell that you're really passionate you really care about the district. So thank you and continue to come to our meetings. Um, and, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you on April 29th. Mr. Ryland, is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Yeah, just real quick, really, really, really outstanding work. I mean, you guys all deserve a round of applause. And I, I mean, you guys did an outstanding job today. I'm really proud to be a part of this bond steering committee family. I consider it a family now. It feels like a family now the amount of work and passion that you put into it. So thank you so very, very much. So keep the fire burning and we'll see you at the next meeting. Take care. Good night, everyone. Enjoy a nice evening.